Ecclesiastes <coughs> chapter 9, verse 16 and 17. Wisdom is better than strength. Verse 16 says, Then said I, Wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised, and his words are not heard. The words of wise men are heard in quiet more than the cry of him that ruleth among fools. And here we begin to be introduced to the wisdom of God. We begin to be introduced to the kind of wisdom <clears throat> that comes from the Lord. The kind of wisdom that is the Lord. And many people fear weakness. <clears throat> they fear their failures. They fear, some people would say, being exposed as not good enough or not strong enough. <clears throat> And they wrestle with it in such a manner that they try to present themselves as different than what they are. <clears throat> and this can go on in Christianity and does, where we are so concerned about religion and we're so concerned about appearances, and that's really what religion has a lot to do with, is just appearances, how we look to people that we lose out on the most important things. And when we get that way, we start becoming self-focused. We're concerned about us. We're concerned about how we look to people. <clears throat> and that is that begins to bring the focus down in on us and who we are and how good we're doing and how things are going to be. And, <clears throat> and so... Um, that's really what the Pharisees ended up doing, is they became hypocrites. A hypocrite is actually a theatrical word that comes from when they would put on a mask and, and act, which is real interesting, because I think religion is full of acting. And, um, and I think that a lot of the acting is really based on our fears it's not just a desire to look good. It is a fear to look bad. It is the fear to look weak. It's a fear to find out in one sense what we're all really made of. And apart from Christ, we're all flesh. I mean, so there's no need putting on a front about flesh because that which is flesh is flesh is what Jesus said. No need trying to paint it up or make it look better. Flesh is flesh. <clears throat> but there is, a, there is a place to reach. There is a level beyond just being um, improved flesh. And these scriptures begin to kind of <clears throat> introduce that wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. And someone who labors in the Lord, whether it's their own ministry or ministry involved with the church or <clears throat> whatever, can become very concerned about how they look, if they're being successful, if their ministry is prospering, if people are acknowledging them, if, if people are sensing that they're doing a good work for God. And... Uh, <clears throat> you know, you can start worrying about numbers. You can start worrying about appearances on that front. And it is true that the more you learn true wisdom, the truth is the less people are going to want to listen to you. You'd think more people would want to listen to you. I mean, you would. You would think more people just flock to you and respect you and say, oh, you speak such wisdom and you have such great things. But... The truth is that it doesn't really happen that way. A lot of times, <clears throat> as we begin to really know the Lord, we begin to be cut back. It's like, a, it's like a tree that's got a lot of branches, and God wants to bring forth fruit on that tree. And the, and the only way he's going to do that is he starts whacking the things that make us look good so that, you know, so that we can have more fruit. <clears throat> and so the cutback begins to happen, and this says that the poor man's wisdom is despised. And that is because the very wisdom of God is based on the cross. And the wisdom of God is based on not putting yourself forward, not declaring yourself, 
not becoming something in yourself. And it seems like the whole world is, is out to become famous, you know, get their 15 minutes of fame or something like that. And so um, <clears throat> it, it, the wisdom of God uh, will not declare itself, will not start putting itself forward. We'll start putting the Lord forward. We'll start putting others forward. But when you become a poor man, and I, I always think of that scripture, the way that it's quoted in the book of Acts, it's out of Isaiah 53, but it's quoted in the book of Acts. It says, in his humility, his judgment was taken away. Do you understand what that means? If he didn't stand up for himself and say, look, I'm the son of God. I'm the Messiah. I'm the one. I'm the, you know, they wouldn't believe him. You've got to declare yourself. You've got to become someone great. You've got before anybody really wants to listen to you. You've got to really prove to everybody that you're great before they're going to give you an ear. And yet what did Jesus do? The Bible says that he opened not his mouth, that he didn't declare himself. That they want, they're, they're saying, if you're the son of God, tell us. And Jesus would not sit there and declare himself. Jesus also said, blessed are the poor in spirit. And that is a combination of recognizing our own weaknesses and not thinking that we're something. And with that, a mixture of not wanting to put ourselves forward or to go by our own strengths or any of that. And so he says, the words of wise men are heard in quiet more than the cry of him that ruleth among fools. And so you see men standing, you know, I mean, you can picture anything from Adolf Hitler before thousands and thousands of people to maybe some pulpits in America, I don't know, where men are ranting and raving and, you know, carrying on and preaching and moving and acting and doing all this kind of stuff and you got a <clears throat> you know a big band that's playing and you got all sorts of fancy whatever <clears throat> and, pe and people flock to hear that and they do people flock to hear that Jesus when he walked had a little band of 12 people <laughs> I mean you could have said this is foolish you claim to be the Messiah. You're the, you're the one, right? You're the Messiah. And let, yet look at you. You were a carpenter's son. <clears throat> you're running around with fishermen and outcasts. This is no way to start the kingdom. You know, the wise way would be, you know, and, and when he did get the multitude, he would get all these great big multitudes. And every time, and you check this out in the scriptures, Every time it says, and great multitudes gathered unto him, he began to preach the cross. Except, a man, except you deny yourself and take up. He would do that. He wasn't trying to please great multitudes. He was trying to speak the wisdom of God, the heart of God, the truth of God. And so when I think of this word, the words of wise men are heard in quiet. <clears throat> I actually see Jesus standing there before Pontius Pilate who says, you better talk to me. Don't you know that I have power to let you live or to put you to death? Don't you know that I have that power? And Jesus looked him straight in the eye and finally spoke up and said, you have no power at all except it be given of God. I think of when he stood there and he opened not his mouth Wisdom is heard more in quietness sometimes. It's a wisdom that is not necessarily of words. Not necessarily. Certainly it is. And Paul talks about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and particularly 2. But not necessarily heard in words. And then the next verse it says, um, um, <clears throat> or verse 16, Then said our wisdom is better and strict. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised. And his words are not heard. If you will make enough noise, somebody will listen to you. It doesn't matter what you say. I was watching just flipping through the TV the other night and stopped, and they had at least two commercials in a row on losing weight. And they were both completely different programs. You know. And... Uh, 
You know, you watch long enough, they'll tell you everything. You know, recently they came on the news and said milk isn't really good for you. It's, you know, <clears throat> you know, I mean, who knows what's good for you? Well, I'll tell you, God knows. The Lord knows. And that's who we ought to be listening to. All right. Um, let's, let's turn to Romans 7. Let me just read this last scripture in the seventh chapter of Romans to begin to understand why weakness and, and apparent lack of victory disturbs us. <clears throat> because, you know, everybody's looking for the victory. We want the victory, you know. And when you, when you listen to a lot of pulpits, here's how you get the victory, or seven steps to a victorious life, or seven steps to a, building a great church, or ten steps to having prosperity, or, you know, it's all of this, this stuff on how we're going to explain out how you get the victory. And for, even for us here, the victory may be considered things like his life being manifested in you, when that's not the first victory, that's really a result of victory. But that's, that's, we get focused down on, I want Jesus manifested in me, or I want the Spirit of God to reveal Jesus in the Scriptures, and I want to be able to see Him, or I want, I want Jesus to move in our midst in such a manner that people will want to come and hear Jesus and seek Jesus and go after Jesus. I want, you know, and that's a form, you know what, that's a form of prosperity, that's a form of success. And when those things don't happen, and many of you here will spend most of your life in ministry, you'll go through a time when apparent success is not there. You will question where you are based on what you see and what's happening around you and how good it's happening or how good it's not happening. And you'll begin to try to second guess yourself. Is this of God? Am I of God? Am I following God? Am I doing the right thing? Is this the, am I on the right path here? Because you're trying to find the victory before you actually have found the victory. <laughs> that's the best way I know how to put it. So when, when God's looking for the victory, He's looking at your heart. Because the only victory that you can bring is your faith in Him. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things already not seen yet, the evidence of things not seen. Faith, as God sees it, is faith in God's seed. Not just his son far away, not just one far away, but the seed of his son, the life of his son, the only faith that you can have that's going to bring forth any victory in your life is faith in him, not in yourself. Faith in what he produces, not in what you produce. And there are people running around trying to produce because they're, because they're like Abraham who isn't bringing forth the seed yet, no manifestation of it. They're out building Ishmael's so that they look successful, so that they don't feel bad if they go to a minister's meeting and people say, you know, one of the first questions they ask you at a minister's meeting is, well, you know, how many people you got? You know, it is. Every time I, I go and that's what they say, you know, that's what they say. I, you know, last, last pastor's meeting that I remember somebody asking me that, they said, well, how many people you running? And I said, well... I'm running about 150, but I'm only catching about 50. You know, <laughs> you know. <clears throat> out of control herd. That's what I got. <laughs> and so we get our eyes off of ourselves, and our faith begins to be in in the seed, it, but in the one who is all, as God sees that, but in the one who is going to be produced in you, the one who will fulfill all. And he's not produced in you yet because faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's not that you see him fully manifested in you. You may desire that, but you've got to have faith in that seed. And you've got to come to a place where you believe that this seed, which is Christ, is the only one God will ever want and be satisfied with. 
because that's the only thing that's going to cut off the Ishmaels in your life. As long as you think it's you, as long as you think it's something that you produce, your goodness, your measure, your stature, your fullness on any level, then you will continue to, to try to produce that. As long as you have fear of your own weaknesses, you will tr continue to try to cover up and try to look a certain way and try to present yourself a certain way when God has placed His seed within you with one purpose, that He'll come forth and that by His coming forth, He'll be satisfied. And by your coming forth, He will be turned off. <laughs> and for you to recognize that. And for you to come to that because you, you, you wonder why you, you, um, you know, you wonder why you get upset because, well, you know, I was wanting to be more involved in a certain ministry or I was wanting to be up front more or whatever. That's a thing about us. That's about us trying to, we're worried about us. We must come to a place where our weakness actually is not going to be covered up anymore in this sense. Because we realize that it's not about strengthening our weakness. And so I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to strengthen my own weakness. I'm going to come to the knowledge of the Lord. I'm going to come to the reality where Christ is being produced in me. <clears throat> Turn with me to Genesis. And of course, Abraham is always a perfect example of this sort of thing. Genesis chapter 12. In verse, uh, let's read uh, 6 and 7. Genesis 12, 6 and 7. <clears throat> and Abraham passed through the land unto the place of Shechem, unto the oak of Morah. And the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Now this is huge right here. Because the first words that Abraham heard when he was back in what, what was Babylon back then, Ur of Chaldees, which was the country of Babylon, which today is modern day Iraq, Abraham, the words that he heard, the words that he heard from God was, come leave this land and I will give you a land. But now he has come to this place and God is beginning to open his ears more and here the Lord appears to him. In other words, he's not listening to a sermon. <laughs> he's not going to church. He's not just... God himself has made an appearance to him in the, in the sense of this. God appeared to him and said, Unto your seed will I give this land. Not to you. It never really was about you. It was about the seed that's going to come out of you. Now we know from Galatians 3.16 and we know John 3.16, we need to know Galatians 3.16, that he says, the promises were made unto Abraham, he saith not unto seeds as of many, but as of one unto thy seed, which is Christ. The promises and the fulfillment of the promises of God are fully wrapped up in the seed, not in us except as the seed is in us. In other words, your Christianity is not worth anything without Christ coming forth. <laughs> God's not looking for religion. He didn't come to start another religion. Well, I started a religion called Judaism, and now I, you know, I don't like that one. I messed up on that one. I think I'm going to start over here. His plan always was, and this is the beginning of the Jews. Here's the first Jew right here. His name's Abraham. And the first word, the first reality that came to Abraham is not I'm going to raise up a Jewish nation or a Christian nation, but unto thy seed, which seed it describes in Galatians 3.16, is Christ. There is no hope in you 
outside of this seed. And Abraham is, is listening to God. He's getting the message. And all of a sudden, the journey that he has made, the stuff that he has done, everything he's done has brought him to this very moment that, oh my God, this is not about me at all. This is about the seed of God within me, which is Christ. And everything changes from then on. The focus begins to change from himself. And in fact, right shortly after this, uh, faith is counted to him for righteousness because his faith is in the seed now, not in himself. He, he you know, he left, by faith, he left yes. Babylon. But that faith was not counted to him for righteousness. The faith in the seed was what was counted to him for righteousness. And so what does he do? He builds an altar. That's what it says right here. Under thy seed will I give this land. And there he built an altar unto the Lord who appeared to him. Not just to the Lord. Not just a religious reaction. There was a death that took place. There was a cross that took place. He built an altar and he said, this is, you know, as I've said many times, Abraham, you can mark Abraham's life according to the altars as he moves. I mean, the progression from start to finish, he's continually seeing God, meeting God, and building a new altar. His whole life is marked by altars. It's like one funeral after another. <laughs> he's, you know, well... You know, here was my plans and what I thought was going to happen and I thought I was going to be a great man of God and I was the only one in Babylon that God appeared to and I thought I was going to go build this great thing and it was going to be all about me and I'd be... And it's not about me. Let's build another altar and get your servants over there. Let's build an altar here. The death of me again. And the life of him. But... Mark this, that revelation hit him so deep that he never ever got caught up. And when I say never ever got caught up, obviously Ishmael came later. But he never ever got caught up outside of the seed. He knew deep within that the, that the seed was promised of God. He just got confused as to what was the seed. Because you don't, you, <clears throat> you'll misapply God's words, amen? I do it. <clears throat> You'll think that it's, okay, well, it's not directly about me, so that it's, a, it's about Eliezer, my servant, and that's what he said at one point. And then later he says, okay, it's about Ishmael, my son from Hagar. No, it's not about that one. We've got to find the right seed, which seed is Christ, but we've got to discover him. And we, in other words, we've got to keep going on our journey because the altars will keep cutting away everything until nothing's left but Jesus. Hallelujah. And that's the plan of God. All of his promises to you, all of his promises to Abraham were to the seed. Nothing else. Any, any hope of fulfilling the word of God, of, of, of being a father of a multitude, any hope of, of, of dwelling in this land, any hope of filling up the land, any hope of all that God said to him. Anybody ever had God say something to you? All the hope of God fulfilling that is not you, not your goodness, not try harder, not go for God even in that sense. It's bound up in the seed. And there is no hope for fulfilling the word of God outside of the seed. It's not going to be. It all rests in the seed. Abraham, well, he had nothing to offer. Look in uh, verse 4 here, I think it says... Uh, so Abraham, this is just before the scriptures we read. So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abraham was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. He was seventy-five when he first heard about the seed. He was a hundred years old, ninety-nine years old, when he finally had it. <laughs> you know? Faith has got to be there somewhere. Faith in the seed has got to be there or we're hopeless. And so Abraham, he's old. He's, he's starting out 75. You know, I mean, God, why didn't you call me in my 20s? Why didn't you manifest when I was 22 in the strength of my life? That's exactly the problem. 
In all the strength of your life, we'd have just run into way more trouble than we already got. You know? Why did you wait till I was already too old to even bring forth the seed? He not only was old, he, he couldn't have seed. He was too old for that. And not only that, but he was 75 and he just kept every year 76, 76. Well, trust me, it's a long time from 75 to 99. So what does that mean? Every year the situation gets more hopeless. It doesn't get better. I mean, really, that begins to, you know, you just start seeing this thing. Oh, my God, you know, and things, you know, God came to me. God appeared to me. God spoke to me. And yet, I'm getting further instead of closer to this thing. You better have faith in the seed. You better not lose faith in the seed. You lose faith in yourself. Yes, amen. That'd be good. You need to lose faith in yourself. But never lose faith in the seed. There's always hope because the hope is not in you in the sense of being you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's go to Romans chapter 4. These are some scriptures that talk about the faith of Abraham. Many of you are familiar with them. First, verse 4 and... Uh, 18. Yeah. <clears throat> Many of you are real familiar with these scriptures. Romans 4, 18, and we'll read 19 also. Who against hope believed in hope. Now, okay, let me just say something about that right there. Who against hope believed in hope. There's two things there. There's hope and there's faith. Against hope, believed in hope, didn't have hope, but believed in hope. It's possible to be hopeless and still have hope by faith. Right. <laughs> it's an amazing thing. See, the world will tell you, even some Christians will tell you, well, no, if you don't really have something, then you got nothing. Abraham had nothing. Without the seed, there was no hope of fulfilling anything that God had for him. And yet, against hope, it doesn't say he had hope. It doesn't say against hope or without hope he had hope. It says against hope he believed in hope. That's the difference. Your faith keeps it alive when there is no hope in you. When you look at yourself and you say, I'm, I started out a mess. And from every year after this, I'm only going to get worse? <laughs> you know? What hope is there? There is no hope. There's only faith in hope. Faith in hope of the seed. Praise God. So, eventually everything begins to change. And, and in fact, eventually Abraham's faith begins to change. That's right. Eventually, there starts becoming a change where, um, well, let me finish reading the scriptures here. Who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken. Ah, so shall thy seed be. You see, his faith is in hope in relationship to the seed. He's not, saying, he's not thinking, well, every day and every way I'm getting better and better. You know, that's actually a teaching thing that, you know, you can go to and they'll help you meditate and say that. And you can actually think that about yourself. Every day and every way you're getting better and better and, and you're not. <laughs> you know. And even if you were, you still wouldn't be the seed. And you're still hopeless. Because the hope has got to be in him and not in ourselves. So... Verse 19, and being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead. <laughs> That's all he's got. God has to work in our lives. He has to start working. And he has to start breaking down before he can ever build anything up. 
He's got to start breaking down the hope in ourselves. He's got to start breaking down the thought that we've got something to offer. He's got to start breaking down our fear of being seen as weak, our fear as being a failure, our fear, all the fears of how we would appear to somebody. He's got to get our minds off of ourselves. Well, first of all, he has to prove us that we're weak. Oh, I never did turn to Romans 7, I guess. The last verse said this. Paul says, oh, wretched man that I am. God didn't first bring, because he's about to come to a revelation of Christ as his life. He didn't reveal his son in him first. He revealed his weaknesses and brokenness and lack and frailties and human qualities that were easily seduced. So much so that after coming to God, he says, oh, wretched man that I am, I am worse now than before I met God. <laughs> now you're not. You're the same man, aren't you? <laughs> you're the same person. Just the Lord's working in your life to show you what you really are. With purpose. And finally, Paul says, oh, wretched man that I am, and thank God that isn't all. And some of you do that. You say, oh, wretched person that I am, and then you just sit down and pout. <laughs> That's not the end that God's trying to bring us to. So we'll all be discouraged and depressed and just sit around and say, well, nobody's no good. That's not the end goal. Right. He said, oh, wretched man that I am, who... Not what shall deliver me. As long as you're still looking for a what, you're in trouble. You can find out how wretched you are and still not come to the who of the situation. You will come to the what. You might come to God, but you're looking for him to give you a what. Oh, wretched man that I am, what shall deliver me? What, is it revival? Is it fasting? Is it Give me the ten steps to victory. Well, there are not ten steps. There are no steps. There's just a person. His name is Jesus. And it is Christ in you. The hope of glory. Interesting. Not Christ in heaven. Colossians 1.27. Christ in you. The hope. No hope. Christ out of you, not living in you. Not, when I say not Christ out of you, I don't mean that he's not in there. I just mean he's not living in you. Christ out of you, no hope of living gloriously. Christ in you by his life, oh, in the face of no hope by looking at yourself. There's all hope while we look not at ourselves now dead. Telling words, his body now dead, realizing this thing cannot happen by me. I am totally, totally unable to do this. It's not going to happen if I keep looking to me. I've got to not have a breakthrough. I've got to start looking elsewhere. <laughs> and, you know, you start, you know, I can see Abraham at 98 thinking, my God, if this thing don't happen quick. You know, <laughs> you know. Well, that's the, that's the hopelessness that he brings you to. So that you'll turn to the who of the situation. Who shall deliver me from this body of death? Well, then the seed comes. You know, it's an amazing thing that begins to happen. God had dealt with Abraham for all of this time to wait on the seed. To get the seed. It's all in the seed. It's all wrapped up in Him. It's all wrapped up in Christ. It's all wrapped up not in Christ in heaven, but Christ in you. And His faith is focused not at Himself or faith for things, but in the Lord. And all of a sudden, God begins to change the game again. It's like He knocks all the, che the checkers off the board and sets up a chessboard. What is this? You know? Because at first your hope is all in Christ in you. And you've waited. 
and you've prayed and you've longed for and you've believed that there's only one thing that's going to please the Father and it's going to be His seed in me. There's only one thing that's, going to, that's ever going to produce anything and it's seed in me. And all of a sudden, there's a whole nother thing thrown in by the Father. You can see it back in Genesis. If you want to turn there with me, Genesis chapter 22. Have you ever considered that there is a change of faith? I want you to consider that there's a change of faith again. Genesis 22. <clears throat> Finally, after all of these years, the seed comes forth and Abraham lives for many years with Isaac the, representing the seed, which is Christ. He finally has the sun coming forth. You understand what I mean? The sun is coming forth. And he's living in the joy of that and the wonder of that and the blessing of that and the strength of that and the peace of that. Anybody with me on what I'm saying here? Christ coming out of you, living his life through you. It's finally the promises are being fulfilled. All that you ever wanted is, is by another life, not your own life. Another strength, not your own life. Strength, another hope, not your own. It's everything that you've waited for and hoped for and dreamed of, and all of a sudden, God shows up again. Oh my, what is this going to be about? Genesis 22, verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did test Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. Sounds like they had a good relationship by now. The father and the son... Abraham, here I am, Lord. <laughs> he has no clue what's fixing to happen. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. This could throw you for a loop if you have believed that the sun coming out of you, that the strength and life and power and victory and peace that you've been living in because Christ has been revealed in you is the whole ball of wax. Is anybody getting what I'm saying here? If you believed it, if you've thought that was it and that's what it's all about and that's the only thing that it's all about, then, then you could really be thrown you're going, what? why are you saying this to me? What are you talking about? This is the hope of all the fulfillment. You've taught me that. The devil didn't teach me that. Religion even taught me something different than that. I have been with you in faith, and now you're telling me to put to death the very thing that has been life for me that has sprung life out of me and life for others. And the, 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 the tents of Abraham, you remember he had hundreds of servants and everything by then. And uh, the life has sprung forth among the tents of Abraham. If you don't understand, if your faith isn't beyond Christ in you as life, You're going to miss the point. Thank God, apparently Abraham had been being prepared for in verse 3, and Abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and cut the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went into the place which God told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the young and the lad will go yonder. Abraham was from Texas. I will go yonder and worship and come again to you. My, I mean, 
I don't get Holy Ghost goosebumps very often. But the thought that this man was so in tune with the, with the Heavenly Father that he's, he, he hears this and he rises up early and he gets the wood and he gets all that he needs and he heads to this place. And when he gets there, he tells the young men, he looks up and he sees Moriah and he says to the young man, stay here for me and the lad are going to go worship. We're going to do real worship. You know, Romans 12 says that. It says, present your bodies a living sacrifice. For this, and here's the King James, for this is your reasonable service. In the original Greek, it says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto the Lord. For this is the highest form of spiritual worship. There was something in Abraham that connected with God in those altars. There wasn't just an experience and then he built an altar. And the experience was everything. The altars where God appeared. There was the appearing of God and immediately upon the appearing of God, every time a breakthrough in, in revelation, in knowledge, in understanding, in relating to God, and every time an altar because his life began to be formed by the appearing of God, the, the increase of the reality of God and the altars, all of that together began to form this man until the time came that God appears and says something again. He goes, another altar. This one's just a little different than the others. But it's still an altar. I'm still got a, I've got an appearing and I've got an altar. So... He connects worship, not with raising of hands, not with a certain kind of music. He connects it with a certain way of living and a certain action that takes place in his life. Well, you know the story. I guess we can read just a little more. And he took, in verse 6, And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son. And he took the fire in his hand and a knife. And they went both of them together. They went both of them together. I want to protect my kids. I want to protect my, my little ones. I want to protect my grandsons. I want to protect my granddaughter. I want to. No, I want them all to go with me while I go to the cross. Because only this way, it's the, this way is the only way. And if it's God's way, it's not just God's way for me. It's God's way for my wife. It's God's way for my children. It's God's way for my grandchildren. It's God's way for the family of God that I serve with. If it's God's way, if it's God's heart, then I don't need to be fearing loss again. Before it was the fear of loss, then that I would be exposed as weak. Now it's the fear of loss of what God's given me. You can live in fear constantly. Or you can live in Christ. And there is no fear in love. That's what the Bible says. There is no fear in love. you got to get out of duty and out of religion and get into love. You need to fall in love with Jesus again if you, if you hadn't gotten to that place. Love is where it's at. I'm telling you, it is. They went... They went both of them together. You didn't have to use both and the word together. But together, together, let's be together in the Lord. Let's not play at this. Let's really go for God with all of our heart and whatever it is that he's got in his heart. And Isaac spoke unto Abraham, his father, and said, My father, isn't that great? He didn't just say father. I love the word my. I use that a lot with Jesus. I say my Jesus. You know, I don't just, you know, Jesus could be just some generic term. He's not just Jesus to me. He's my Jesus. He means something. My father, and he said, here my, my son, my son. And he said, behold the fire and the wood, 
But where's the lamb for a burnt offering? Here Isaac, a little boy, fixing to enter into the cross, fixing to enter into this, some reality here. <clears throat> says, where, I see the fire, I see the wood, I see the, the knife for sacrifice, but where's the, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. And then it says again, so they went, both of them, together. Every step of the way, for my wife, every step of the way, I've had to share the truth of Jesus, of the cross, of everything, and have altars or places where we looked one another in the eye and said, here is the truth. It will cost us here. I understand. Let us both go together. With my children, I've had to explain phases and steps and everything and, and look them in the eye and share with them. And as they comprehend, as they comprehend the truth and as they trust in their father's heart, they say, let us go together. With my grandkids, to tell them the truth, to tell them the truth. And not just tell them the truth as some generic floaty truth of floating around, but to tell them the truth and then say, let us go together. With your kids. And your husbands and your wives. We've got phases and steps and we've got to keep stopping Nailing down the truth and then going on together. Amen? Yes. Hallelujah. Nailing down the truth and going on together. Praise God. So, this change starts coming from no longer is it just the seed. No longer is it the seed alone. No longer is it just the seed that if I could just bring forth the seed or have the seed in me. But Genesis 22 begins to introduce not just Christ, but Christ and Him crucified. God. That's what Paul claimed that he preached. Remember that? I preach Christ and Him crucified. There is a wisdom that's greater than strength. greater than the strength of the life of the burgeoning forth of the life, the abundant life of Christ. There is a strength beyond that. If you can imagine. If you can imagine. There, I mean, you're talking about a root and fatness in Jesus coming forth in you as a branch. It's incredible. That just, you know, uh, we were out at the ranch just this past weekend and some of the trees I noticed the buds all over just buds and little green things starting to stick out and just I mean you know what it's going to be like that that look dead and everything and all these dry gray or brown branches all of a sudden just, and you just look one day and it'll just life is just ready it's just standing there ready to just break forth and and if it's a fruit tree then soon after the strength of a, that life pushing through that branch and then pushing through those buds and then pushing Pushing fruit out, not produced spontaneous because life is filling you so much you think, my God, can it get any better than this? For the Father it can. For the plan of God, for the nature of God the Lamb. The Son of God is one thing. The Lamb of God is another. Abraham's faith. Turn with me to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter 4. Or I'm sorry. Uh, Galatians 6. Galatians 6, 14. <clears throat> But God forbid that I should glory. And the word glory actually here is boast. God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's good enough right there. His boasting wasn't just in Christ. 
was in this reality of the cross and how it works. Abraham's faith was first in the seed. Then it began to be in the death of the seed. The death of the seed in you. The dying of the Lord Jesus. The coming forth of the Lord Jesus. I mean, at first you're dried up and you're lifeless and there's no ability to produce. And then all of a sudden there's life and peace and power and everything else. And then God appears again in Genesis 22 and begins to speak to you. And he says, all hope, Abraham. All the hope of many nations doesn't just lie in this seed. It lies in the fact that you take him to Moriah and there be a death. All hope lies in the death of the seed. Folks, I'm not just talking about an experience out here. I'm talking about a growth in, in faith in you where you come to a place by your faith where you don't look at yourself and you begin to look at Jesus. And finally the revelation of Christ comes and the fullness of the abundant life starts coming out of you. And then God comes and readjusts your faith again and says it's not just Jesus in you. Not just his life in you that I want. I want the death of him. I want you to offer up the seed. I want a lifestyle of altars and of the cross. I want you constantly given not just the life of the seed but death working in you also. That life would work in others. So instead of just demonstrating the Son as an individual, instead of just demonstrating the Son, you demonstrate the Lamb. Who is it on the throne when it's all over with? The Lamb of God. And let me, let's turn to Hebrews 11, and I'll try to wrap this up pretty quick here. Hebrews 11, and verse 17 and 18. We've had, by faith Abraham did this, by faith Abraham did that. Folks, there's a new level of faith. Verse 17, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he that, received the prom he that received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac shall thy seed be called. There is a faith that is connected not just to the seed, but the giving of the seed, the lifestyle of laying down your life that others may be receive life. Of laying down your time that others may receive more of Jesus. Of laying down of you, what would please you and make you happy. Because you're pleasing the Father by the Lamb coming forth in the laying down. You're, you're laying the groundwork for others to have life and, f and blessing and freedom. As you pour out that same Spirit you must leave the faith just of the Son of God and come to the faith in relationship to the Lamb of God. Here's what it sums up to. Eventually, you've, you actually no longer believe that the seed, that Jesus is the, the answer for the world. Eventually, you believe that life will only come out of death. You believe that with all your heart. You believe that and you go, you know what? It's not about me having Jesus come forth and become a great man and everybody say what a great man because folks, you can be a great man and even have Christ coming out of you and, and no fruit come forth. But you can die and become less and less that he, that he might increase in others and that he might increase in the world and there be actually more of Jesus when you died. It says that of Samson. He killed more Philistines in his death than with the jawbone of an ass and all of the things that he did. We want to get the strength of Samson and take a jawbone of an ass and work for God. I'm telling you there's a place where more power, more strength will come forth when we begin to embrace the death of Christ. And you believe the only hope that's ever going to happen for this world is going to be found in death. And I'm going to let the seed die in me. I'm going to let the lamb die in me. 
you talk about triumph. This is the triumph of faith. This is that triumph. Where you start in weakness and you are afraid to be seen as weak and you hate your frailties and you hate the pitifulness of your condition. And so you seek the abundant life of Christ and he begins to come forth and finally you're free and finally there's the victory and then he appears again and he says, now I'm going to send you back to weakness, but not the same weakness. It's going to be a weakness that is strength to me. The wisdom of God is greater than strength. <laughs> the power of God is, you know, that's, let's, let, I'll try to close with this scripture, okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 12. And we'll just read this and try to close. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. This was when Paul was given a thorn in the flesh that made him weak. This was the beginning of the process where he moved from the strength of the life of Christ to the weakness of, his, uh, of the cross. And he prayed that God would take it away and God didn't do it and God's answer for not taking it away was he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, Paul says, will I glo rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasures in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. Not just those things, but those things for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. He's found that he's no longer afraid of weakness. It becomes his tool, his vehicle to bring forth Christ. Let's pray. Father, we just so desire for there to be an increase of Christ in the earth. We ask you. We ask you. Open our eyes to the next phase. The phase of the cross, not just Christ, but Christ in him crucified. Not just preaching Christ, but Christ crucified. Not just living Christ, but living Christ crucified. May we see that the only hope for the world is not just the life of the Son, but the death of the Lamb. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you.